Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is a home interview in Gilderland, New York. It is the 18th of September, 2007. Approximately 1 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is Roman S. Lipinski. I was born July 23rd, 1922. And I was born in Queens County, New York, but basically most of my adult life was lived in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. What was your educational background before you went into service? I went into uh, grammar school, high school, and I was in my last year at St. John's University. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, I went into service February 27, 1943, and I had like two more months to graduate. But while I was in service, they notified my family that St. John's decided to give me my degree, the Bachelor of Arts degree, regardless of the fact that I didn't finish the last two months of school, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And you, that's my education. Okay. Grammar school, high school, college. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was in Brooklyn. Oh. <laughs> I was in Brooklyn and uh, I know it was a Sunday morning and I said, uh, I think at that time I said to myself, this is going to change everybody's life because I, have an, I had an older brother who, believe it or not, was inducted into the Army in 1940. They had inducted him. Yes, right. And he was going to serve one year and come out. And unfortunately, uh, war was declared uh, right after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. So he did not come out of service. Mm -hmm. He stayed into service uh, for another, oh, three and a half or four years. Uh, he, he was in there much longer than I was. And uh, he was uh, with an anti-aircraft group where he, he went over to. Uh, originally, he was in the Pacific. Mm -hmm in Bora Bora, and then he got sick on Bora Bora, his stomach had trouble. They brought him back to the United States, they put him in a hospital for a while, they cured whatever illness he had, and then believe it or not, they put him in another unit, and they shipped him over to Europe. And he ended the war, I think, in Czechoslovakia or mm -hmm. something like that. So that in our family, we had two guys in service. Mm -hmm. And there were only two of us, my brother and I. We mm -hmm. had two other sisters. Both survived the war then, too. Both survived the okay. war. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I, I enlisted in, uh, to the United States Army Air Corps at that time mm -hmm. in November of 1942. I knew that I was close to being drafted, so I figured I would want to enlist in what I want to go into. Why did you want to go into the Air Corps? Oh, that's, that's a better life and a higher type of life and a cleaner type of life. I could not stand slugging through the mud or any of that stuff. Had you, ever, want, had you ever flown? No, 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 no. Other than maybe take a flight someplace, but that's mm -hmm. not it. Mm -hmm. No, and, and then when I went in, and when they drafted me, when they didn't draft me, they called me because uh, to, to enter service, I entered the Army Air Corps, and I took uh, tests with them. So at first they put me in pilot training, and I went in, there's this, when you get that kind of training, you get primary, basic, and advanced. Mm -hmm. 
I, I passed primary training very well, flying. I soloed with the bi-wing airplanes at that time. And then I went into a basic training where now you had a 450 horsepower engine, which was the basic trainer. And I flew and I soloed. I even soloed at night. But don't ask me why I flunked out of pilot training in, uh, in that I couldn't fly under the hood. Once the pilot instructor told me to put the hood over my head, something happened to Lipinski. The plane would not go straight <laughs> or something like that. So they flunked me. They they threw me out. Were you ever claustrophobic or anything? Is I, that... I'm not that claustrophobic. That's what huh. I don't understand. But once they put that hood over my head, I was flying a different kind of an airplane. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't right for me. So they sent me to navigational school in uh, September of '44. And I finished navigational school and I became a second lieutenant in the Army Air Corps, at that time still, a uh, navigator. Now, whereabouts was that school? In San Marcos, Texas. S-A-N-M-A-R-C-O-S. Okay. And how long was that course? Uh, from September to December. Okay. But I guess my math must have been pretty good to influence them to send me to navigational school. Now, did you have to learn celestial uh, navigation? Oh, positively. Learned all about the stars, and we had uh, the instrument to shoot the stars. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Sextant. A sextant. That's it, a sextant. And we used to shoot the stars, and uh, it was wonderful. In fact, being overseas on Tinian, uh, whenever you flew, you flew north to go to uh, Tokyo, to Japan. And uh, by the time that I got overseas in June of 1945, the Army had taken Iwo Jima from the Japanese and Iwo Jima was then eventually used as a stop-off place and that's why Iwo Jima was taken because B-29s could not even for that distance and all of the gas it had it couldn't make it from Guam, Saipan, Tinian up to Japan and back. Mm -hmm. They used to lose planes in the ocean and stuff like that for lack of gas. But that's why they took Iwo Jima and we would land on Iwo Jima, load up with fuel again, and go back home. Uh, out of uh, my 11 missions, of which nine were combat and two were the POW missions, uh, I landed on Iwo Jima six times. Mm -hmm. Our crew landed on Iwo Jima six times. Mm -hmm. Because we wouldn't... There were three of us that figured out the computation as to how long our gas would uh, last. And it was the pilot, the engineer, and myself. Now, I don't know who had the greater word, but that's the way we sort of voted mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as to what we should do. And that's it. Now, uh, how long were you, um, when was it when you finally were assigned to a crew? Uh, oh. When were you assigned a crew to a crew? Uh, I guess about January or February of 1945. Because it was uh, in February that we all went to Alamogordo, that famous place where they had an airfield. 
for B-29s. Mm -hmm. And the crew came together, I think, in Topeka, Kansas, or someplace like that in the Midwest. And then we all went to, as a crew, we all went to Alamogordo, New Mexico, where there was an airfield. And uh, we practiced. Now, did, did you always fly um, B-29s? Did you ever fly another type of bomber? No. Well, you were trained on the B-29? Strictly the B-29. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the B-29? Did you like it? Oh, Jesus. It's a huge. Uh -huh. Compared to the B-17. The, the B-17 was small, you know? Mm -hmm. This was much bigger, much larger. And the... Uh, the speed was anywhere from 200 to 220 miles per hour. That's and if you got 220, that means you had a good wind mm -hmm. uh, with you wherever you were going. Now, how many were there in your crew? Eleven. These eleven men. Well, why don't you show us that now? Pardon? Since we're talking about that, why don't you show us that now? If you hold it up in front of you. Now, where and when was that taken? Do you remember it all? No, okay. It's in 1945. Okay. It's before you went I, overseas? I would, I would presume it was done overseas. Overseas? Okay. You now, know? is that your plane behind you? Yeah. Now, did you ever name the planes at all? Yeah, we called our plane the Inchcliffe Castle. I N C H. L-I-F-F, -F, Castle. Could you hold that photo up straight in front of you and I can, I can zoom right in on it? Because our bombardier read a story about an Inchcliffe Castle that was impregnable. Nobody could break into that castle. Nobody could do any damage to it. And he says that's a good name for our airplane. And you know what? We all practically automatically agreed. I never heard of the Inchcliffe Castle in all my life. Mm -hmm. But that's what we called our airplane. Did you paint the name on it? Yes, the name was painted, but it's on the other side of the plane. Mm -hmm. When uh, we used to get on, we would get on from the left side of the airplane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now could you identify the crew? Yes, in a kneeling sort of or a sitting position were the five officers of the crew. Willard Yaki, the co-pilot, Bruce Ross, the radar navigator, Ronald Cleveland, the pilot, myself, Roman S. Lipinski, the navigator, and Tom Higgins, the bombardier. Now, standing above us was Stan Waklowski, the tail gunner, John Satterfield, the engineer, James Sweet, the middle gunner, Dale Webster, the uh, upper set middle gunner, Ralph Paradiso, the radio engineer, and Tom Lambert, another gunner on the airplane. Okay, all right, thank you. I'm shocked that I remember all of this. <laughs> now, um, when did you hit a crash in a B-29? When did that happen? The first time we were all in a B-29 in Alamogordo, New Mexico. We had aboard the ship the 11 crew members plus two pilot instructors plus a gunnery instructor for the rear of the airplane. And uh, our pilot and co-pilot were being taught how to take off and land in the B-29. So what we would do is take off, circle the field, come around, 
and land, and we wouldn't completely stop. We would, when we got near the end of the runway, we would push up a little bit and take off again and come around. And that's how they were teaching the pilot and co-pilot how to land and take off in the airplane. Mm -hmm. And on one of the times that we were coming in to land, uh, we did land. We were coming down, but then number one engine ran away. It went up to 2,700 uh, revolutions a minute instead of 2,200. So it pulled the plane to the left while we were still on the ground. And in pulling the plane to the left, we bounced and that landing gear then collapsed and so forth. And we went up in the air a little bit. But then when we came down, thank God we came down flat. And we rolled to a stop. Uh, regardless, they shut off the engines and everything else. And believe it or not, all 14 of us got out alive. In fact, the, the, well, the, the fire that started was on the left side of the airplane, I guess where number one engine was, and uh, we mostly got out on the right side of the airplane, so that all 14 men who were aboard got out safely. Mm -hmm. Was the plane totally destroyed? Oh, uh, gee. You don't have a picture of here it. Here it is, here. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, that's the plane. That's, that's, that's all that's left. It looks like just a tail that, section. That's, that's just a tail, that's all. That's all that was left. That's all that was left. Wow. Okay. Did you, uh, how did you feel about going off again, taking off again after that? <laughs> We went up the next day. The Army Air Corps didn't want you to sit and think about what mm -hmm. happened the day before. They want you to go up and do your business, start to learn how to operate a B-29 and so forth like that. So there was absolutely no time lost whatsoever in training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's it. We really did go off immediately the next day. Mm -hmm. they didn't. Now, when you went overseas, how did you get overseas? We took our own B-29 mm -hmm. overseas. We were in, the, I guess, Alamogordo, New Mexico. We flew to uh, California. I don't know where we landed. And then maybe like the next day, we flew to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Then we, from Hawaii, we landed and refueled. And we, uh, it was within a day or two that we flew to Kwajalein. And then, and then we refueled in Kwajalein. And we flew to, uh, Believe it or not, we flew to Saipan first, but then from Saipan they sent us. This is just Saipan and Tinian are separated by a little waterly inlet. That's right. all, you know. And uh, and then we stayed on on uh, Tinian for the rest of the stay. Now, what were the living conditions like? What what kind of structures did you live in? Were they Quonset huts? No. Nope. Tents. Tents. You had five officers in the tent. And then you also had the six enlisted men in, in tents. Mm -hmm. We lived separately, mm -hmm. that I have to say. And uh, But we lived in tents. The whole time that, you were there? The whole time we were there. And believe it or not, though, they built Quonset huts for the enlisted men who finished living in the Quonset huts. We still lived in the tents. Mm -hmm. The officers did. 
Now there's a little prejudice there. <laughs> what was I, the food like? Oh, army food is. Uh -huh. And I want to tell you, I always thought that, or felt that the Air Force would be a little better place than just getting army food, you know. And I, I think I was right in that estimate. They always were <clears throat> a bit above the regular army stuff, and uh, which was true. In fact, as a cadet, I spent uh, three months at Syracuse University, believe it or not, and we were taught weather, flying conditions, we were taught about the airplane, what's inside, what the navigator has, and so mm -hmm. forth. So that uh, we, we got an education every place we went. And then when we finished that, that's when we went to Alamogoro, uh, New Mexico, where we practiced, started practicing our training missions and so forth. And uh, the one thing I did notice is that while we were there, they would make like, we were in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Then we would fly over the Gulf of Mexico and come back a little longer trip. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our last flights was a flight out to the Pacific Ocean, the other side of the United States. And we would fly out a bit over the ocean and then we would fly back to Alamogordo, New Mexico. And then we had our air, when we were leaving to go overseas, uh, we had our own airplane. We took our own airplane overseas with us. Now, was there more than one plane that went over, or did you go with uh, just you, you yourselves? Don't, you don't go with anybody else. Mm -hmm. You go by yourself. There is no such thing as uh, flying in formation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going any place. Okay. Oh, we did. You know, maybe the pilots learned how to fly in formation, and they would do that because that they needed training mm -hmm. in that. So that they did, but it was not a basic thing that we did. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Now, what were you? What unit were you assigned to when you reached Tinian? Uh, I think it was the 444th Bomb Squadron. No. No, the squadron was a 678th Bomb Squadron, 444th Bomb Group. That's what it was. Okay, and what Air Force was that? Right, the 24th, 20th Air Force. 20th Air Force, okay. Right. Okay. Um, how many planes were the B-29s were there on Tinian? You know, about well, we were in a, in, a, in a squadron with 18, I think, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, because then there would be 29 bases. One was on Guam, two were on Tinian, one was in Saipan. So there were four bomb groups that we were part of, mm -hmm. and that was the 58th Air Force, I think they called. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. What was your first mission like when you went into Japan? I, I, uh, I have to say this. I, I remember it as if it were yesterday. And we went to a northernmost village in, in, in Japan. You know, Japan is made up of four islands. Mm -hmm. Honshu, Shikoku, Kyushu, and Hokkaido. How do you like that? that and right. we, we were not, Hokkaido is the northernmost island of Japan, and we bombed a town called Sendai, S-E-N-D-A-I. That was our first mission that we did. And, uh, you know, I don't remember if that was a day or a night mission. Uh, it probably was a night mission because we, even out of the nine missions we flew, uh, I think seven of them were night missions, and two of them 
Iwata and uh, Osaka were day missions where on the daytime missions we flew in formation. Flying a night mission, everybody flew isolated, all by themselves. And all we had to do was watch out for not hitting another B-29 on the way up or on the way down. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it was. Did your uh, plane ever suffer any flak damage or any damage from uh, no. the Japanese? No, we had anti-aircraft. <laughs> And the only thing that we were very fortunate with is that they weren't that accurate, but we did feel like pellets of shrapnel falling on top of the airplane, which means they had the wrong height for us. <laughs> because if it blew up near us, we, I wouldn't be talking to you. But what they did is they, they, they flew up and, and then it was above us so that we had shrapnel fall, uh, fall down on the airplane, but never hit or anything like that. Now this is your, your crew in their flight suits? Yeah. Now most of you... You know you, why? Why? Once you go up in the air, the temperature goes down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You need those jackets. Mm -hmm. Now did you wear the, the fleece-lined pants like they did in Europe? Did Depending you? on the altitude. Mm -hmm. Because when you go up, the daytime missions were done from 18 to 20,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, 18 to 20,000 feet, it's no longer local temperatures yes. on the ground, you know. As you go up, it gets colder and colder. So that's why you wore those jackets. Mm -hmm. Now the airplane, I must say this, was heated. But I guess never that much heated that we didn't need the jacket. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing. So now, did you wear flak jackets at all? Uh, yes. We always put them on. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we crashed on that first uh, uh, airplane, first B twenty nine ride. Uh, the pilot had his flight jacket on and the parachute jacket, not the parachute, but the jacket, and he got stuck in the window a little bit, you know? So I ran back to help pull him out, and he says, oh, he, he helped me, but uh, it wasn't that much of a job, you know? <laughs> but we did... Uh, Wear the flight jackets. Mm -hmm. you know? well, how about a flak jacket? That's, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm trying to think. I, I'm sorry, I just don't remember. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, the, the, the nine missions, what were most of your targets? Towns. Towns. Fly over the town and just, because Japan didn't, their towns weren't like Tokyo, you understand? Mm -hmm. But these were little towns that we were bombing, and that, that disrupted their activity. Now, uh, a couple of the towns that we bombed during the day was like Iwata, Iwata was the uh, Pittsburgh of Japan. That's where they made the cars, airplanes, automobiles, everything. And then uh, we also bombed Osaka. Osaka is, was, was just a factory, but it's a big town. And that's where they made ball bearings. And you don't move in the army without ball bearings, mm -hmm. either on your tanks, on your cars, and your airplanes and everything else. So those were two prominent daylight bombing, uh, which we bombed from anywhere from 18,000 to 20,000 feet. The, uh -huh. night, the night bombing missions usually went from six to 10,000 feet. How large of a bomb load could you carry? 
about 12,000 pounds. Now, did your uh, group suffer any losses? Planes being shot down or no, missing? No, we were very fortunate. We lost more planes in training missions and so forth than we did over the targets in Japan, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And that's a truism. That, uh, <clears throat> you see my plane over there? There was another one that we saw because we landed and then we were watching other planes land. One of the B-29s, he tipped his right wing. The right wing propeller hit the ground and then he tried to take off again. Big mistake, he never took off. They, they crashed and everybody in the plane died. At the, that's a horrible sight to watch. Mm -hmm. Horrible sight. And you can't do anything for them. <clears throat> There's no saving anybody. Now you mentioned before you had the Navy build an officer's club for you. Right. What, what, did you know how much what? did you pay them? You told us about paying them. A case of whiskey a week per man. Per day. Well, in other words, if they had six Navy men building the thing, we would give them six cases a week, which we would take from our officers club money. And uh, we, uh, whenever, we were entitled to a, a, a bottle of whiskey a week. The officers, the enlisted men, were only entitled to the 3.2 beer. We could get the 3.2 beer also, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, our pilot, and he's the boss. He decided that out of the five officers, two of us every week would donate our whiskey to the enlisted men and give them two bottles a week. And we would keep three for ourselves for our own personal consumption. Mm -hmm. Which wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. Wasn't bad. And that was a good idea on his part, you know, to give them also. Now you were there when the Enola Gay left. We were on Tinian at the Nineteen, same time. Yes. yes, the Enola Gay was there. Now you, were you aware? They were on Northfield, mm -hmm. and we were on Westfield. Mm -hmm. So that and then uh, Enola Gay was on Northfield, and I had a friend of mine from the neighborhood who was an MP, and uh, at one time when he caught up with me, he said to me, and this is just before the Enola Gay dropped the atom bomb, he says, Ray, uh, my nickname is Ray Raymond, you know, mm -hmm. he called me, there's uh, exceptional security going around on the island at the present time. And he was an MP. He says, we are authorized to stop any car that, or any truck that looks suspicious or anything of that nature. And now when it was over, I realized that's when they brought over the Enola game with the atom bomb and, and dropped it one day and then the next day or mm -hmm. something like that. But that's, we, ordinarily, we would never have heard of it, except that when the deed was done, then it's publicized. And that's the way we learned of it ourselves. What, what was your reaction to a bomb that, that was, was that powerful? Uh, I wouldn't want to be in that play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I honestly wouldn't. You've got to take, I have, must be fantastic precautions as far as safety is concerned and everything else. Mm -hmm. Here with the bombs, you load the bombs, and once we're up in the air, the bombardier, just before we're going to drop, the bombardier would go out. And he tightened up this screw and this screw, and mm -hmm. so the bombs are operational now. Because while we're flying, the bombs are not operational, mm -hmm. you know? And they wouldn't go off. 
But the barber there had to go in, and every one, every bar, he had to go tighten up the right way so that when it drops, it explodes. So uh, I, I wouldn't want to be around the night of bar, you know? Because even, uh, I say security was so high, my friend said, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Did you get to fly over any of the targets that had been hit afterward and no. see them? Or? They would tell us uh, how we did, especially uh, they told us about uh, Osaka that we destroyed 93% of that target, which I thought was a very, very, a very high percentage mm -hmm. because, you know, you bomb and, and you don't know what you're destroying and what you're bombing and stuff like that. Now on the night missions, when you went to Japan, we had one person that was on a B-29 talk about seeing the fires on Japan from miles out. Do you, did you remember seeing those? Not the Japanese fighters. Mm -hmm. We, uh, believe it or not, only twice I think we saw Japanese fighters. Fire. Right. Fire. Fire. Where the cities were on fire. Oh, oh. You'd see that the fire for a hundred of miles after you left Japan. Mm -hmm. Especially at night when you would drop the bombs and then, boy, I want to tell you, whoever the lead bombardier was, he must have been pretty accurate and so forth because we all, we all bombed on him. Mm -hmm. You know, wherever he left the target, wherever we saw a little fire already, bang on, that's where you went in and you dropped your bombs on top of his. So that, uh, but then when you're flying away, mm -hmm. you could see the fire from a hundred miles without any question. As long as you're high enough in mm -hmm. the air in order to see it. So that's fantastic. And who selects the lead bombardier or the lead airplane? I don't know. That's the hierarchy decides that. Mm -hmm. The two POW missions, what were those? You said you had two POW yeah, missions. Yeah, we were loaded up with food supplies. Mm -hmm. And we would drop them. In fact, one, uh, the first one, they must have given us the wrong coordinates of latitude and longitude. We searched for this place, I know, even by railroad identification, you know, that, that helps mm -hmm. you. We couldn't find this POW kid. We spent that day 17 hours in the air and we couldn't find it. The second place we found and we dropped. Now, were these liberated camps? Was this right at the end of well, the war? Well, it's the end of the war, right? Yeah, okay. It was the end of the war. Japan mm -hmm. had uh, given in, they surrendered, and then that was it. So mm -hmm. it was after the war. Okay. But. <clears throat> We had a crazy situation where uh, we couldn't find this prisoner of war camp. And the captain felt if we kept all of this on the plane, we may not make it back to, to Tinian. So as we were leaving Japan, he decided to drop uh, the food on the Japanese seashore, the beaches, you know. So what we did is we went into the ocean and turned around and now we're heading back to Japan. And believe it or not, we opened up the Bombay doors in order to drop the food on the beach. You saw the Japanese people on the beach separate like heck and start running in all directions because they thought since we opened the Bombay doors that we were going to bomb them, you know. We didn't want to bomb them. We, we wanted to drop the food off that, that because we, we wouldn't have made it back mm -hmm. in time. What, what was it like on uh, Tinian when you found out that the war had ended? Everybody started to fire their gun. <laughs> you know, I had a 
45, I never used it. Every officer had a 45. I never used it. So what were they doing? They were shooting the guns. Within an hour, all 45s had to be surrendered <laughs> at the headquarters because they figured they'll be killing each other for crying out loud. Honestly, that's what happened. You know, mm -hmm. it was a, a good story. Now, when did you go back home? When did you go uh, back to the States? Uh, we were one of the October. And I spent uh, a little time at Fort Dix. Now, did you fly back? Or yeah, back yeah, yeah, flew back in the B-20. We flew back from Tinian in our B-29. And we deposited it. Maybe in Utah, something like mm -hmm. that, uh, some airfield that we landed and left the plane, and from there on we all were going wherever. I don't know. I guess we had to go. Well, was it a sad experience to give up that airplane and, and walk away from it for good? Well, I'll tell you what I did when when we came back and we landed. I got out of the airplane and I kissed the ground. I kissed America all over again because we were back. And you know what? A couple of the other guys followed my <laughs> lead. They kissed the ground also, <laughs> which was very good. No, what, but, what, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. When were you discharged? Uh, in fact, it's 12, 30, 45. Mm -hmm. That's the day of my discharge. And I was discharged from Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. Now, when and where was this taken? Then, see, this was, a, I was a cadet. Oh, that was taken very early. Could you so, hold that up, please? Yeah. I was a cadet, and I, I entered into the Army uh, Air Corps at that time. And that was my uniform mm -hmm. as a cadet. Because mm -hmm. as an yeah. officer, uh, there's, there's a big distinction. Mm -hmm. Now, how about this photograph? That's my mother. And was that taken when you were sitting when you returned home? Or this was when I was in Atlantic City, I think, uh, with my mother. Now this. Well, there's the B twenty nine behind us with one of the engines. This is the crew in our, what we used to wear. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously... Can, can you, he hold that up again? I'll get a shot of him and his mother. Uh, you know, okay. I was in Atlantic City for couple of days so my sister brought my mother over to mm -hmm, me mm -hmm. uh, there. Now after this, you, oh, I'm I sorry. Know, I don't know where this was taken. Yeah. It had to be overseas someplace. After you were discharged, did you uh, ever make use of the GI Bill? Yeah. I became, believe it or not, a licensed insurance broker. And uh, the GI Bill paid for it. Mm -hmm. Do you ever do you ever use the fifty two twenty club? Yeah, I used it for the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> fifty two weeks of it, I took it all. <laughs> I didn't work, you know. Mm -hmm. But hey, it was there, so you used it. And you took advantage of it. Yeah. So. Did you join any veterans organizations? What? Veterans organizations. Yeah, I, I belong to the American Legion, and I belong to the Polish Legion of American Veterans. They also have a veterans organization. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I don't know why I never joined the VFW. Mm -hmm. um, were you ever were you active in them? Fairly. Mm -hmm. I knew of them. They knew of me. Mm -hmm. I still belong to the American Legion. Mm -hmm. I pay my annual dues and so forth mm -hmm. and like that. 
And they always have a raffle or something, which I take and so forth like that. But uh, I, I, I am not that active in the organization. Mm -hmm. How do you think your time in the service had it changed or had an effect on your life? Well, well you, you learn a lot about what life is all about, especially being in service. Mm -hmm. And what you're looking for is to preserve your life with the life of the other people on the airplane with you, because you become like a real close family. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my opinion, uh, with the crew, so that uh, it's with the officers. The captain was the captain; he was the boss. All of us were subsidiary officers to him. Mm -hmm. But the enlisted men—they listened to all of the officers, without any doubt. But nobody was ever. Uh, overbearing or something of that nature. It, it's not right. That's not the way to do things, you know. So did you, um, we had a good crew. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone after the war? Yeah, mostly I stayed in contact with the uh, radar operator who was in Ohio, though. It's a pain in the neck. And then Ralph Paradiso, the radio operator. I mean, I was in Brooklyn. And he lived in Queens, and uh, so we were pretty close. In fact, I think he went to my wedding and I went to his wedding, mm -hmm. and so forth, so that we were close. But then, regretfully, he died at a young age. He wasn't even 40 when he passed away. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, I was embarrassed to ask his wife what happened, mm -hmm. but, uh, but uh, fairly close, fairly close. You know, like Satterfield, the engineer was from down south, Yaki was from Indiana, the pilot, Cleveland, he was from Texas, uh, Dale Webster, the, the lead gunner, he was from Nebraska, you know, they were spread out mm -hmm. from all over the place, and that's the way it went. Do you know how many are, are still living at all? No, I have no idea. I, I, the only one I knew I kept them really in touch with was Bruce Ross, and he died. Uh, he was as old as I was, and he died uh, well, some years ago, but uh, that's it. He's the one I kept most in touch with. Okay, well. Thank you very much for your interview. Um, You're quite welcome.